Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Howard Chu. Um, I'm a founder and CTO of this company, Simus Corporation. We're, uh, we're kind of based in the US. We were founded in Los Angeles, but now everybody is scattered to different parts of the world. Uh, like, I took off to Ireland, and people are in France, wherever. Um, I personally have been writing open source software since the 1980s. Um, I actually did write a lot of the code that runs the internet. You know, I mean, Diego wasn't kidding about that. Uh, I've, I've also worked on a lot of the developer tools that most uh, programmers still use today. Um, almost all of the GNU compiler tools, uh, GNU Make, the Linker, the Debugger. I've been through all of that code. I, I have a personal policy that I do not use software that I haven't touched myself. All right. Um, so everything that, like, this Android distro that I'm running on this phone is one that I built. Um, uh, everything on my laptop, you know, the Linux systems, you know, I, I contributed drivers to the kernel, uh, and basically, yeah, I won't touch anything that's closed source. You know, if I can't get my hands inside it, I won't use it. Uh, I did a few years working for NASA at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Uh, I worked on the space shuttle for three years. That was good fun. So I actually do have software that's been in orbit and never crashed. OK. Um, more recently, I've been working on database technology. Uh, this database engine I developed in 2011 has turned out to be the world's fastest, smallest, and most reliable transactional database. Uh, that's kind of interesting because Monero uses it now, so that's kind of cool. Um, I've been working on the OpenLDAP project for almost 20 years, and, and you know we turned that from a small research piece of code into production quality code that today is the world's fastest distributed database. Uh, so lots of other stuff. And I've actually been working in uh, security software for quite a long time. Uh, a lot of the, again, a lot of the foundational uh, defensive software that you see on Unix systems, uh, that came out of work that I did. Um, she's back at JPL. Uh, I've also spent some time reverse engineering, uh, hacking on proprietary protocols like the stuff that Adobe used. Um, and the, these things are still out there on, on the web. You, know, you can still find RTMP dump on GitHub in, in the uh, FFmpeg project. Okay. So, topics for this talk. What is Monero? I mean, you got kind of a flavor of that with Diego's introduction, but I'll get um, a little bit more comprehensive about that. Now, this talk is not going to be, you know, diving deep into the math or the the real details of the technology. Um, the, the Monero Research Lab guys will cover that more through this weekend. But but you'll get a nice overview, right? So first of all, what is Monero? We talked about this. It's a totally private cryptocurrency, but it's still built on a public blockchain, all right? It's still built on a blockchain that um, anybody can participate in. The thing about it that's special, though, is uh, all the transactions that show up in the blockchain are still opaque. That means you can see the details of what's going on inside each transaction, but you can see that the transaction happened. Okay. And uh, where does this name Monero come from? Well, it's actually just a simple word for money. It comes from the Esperanto language. How many of you guys are familiar with Esperanto? Okay. It's a hacker crowd. That's obviously an easy question. Okay. Uh, this project started in 2014, uh, so it's only just barely four years old now. Here's um, a snapshot from Coin Market Cap. It's kind of hard to read, but the, the basic message here is that about a year ago, uh, Monero was worth $22 per coin. Uh, I updated this last night. It's about uh, $98 somewhere around 100 bucks. Um, 
back in January, it reached a peak of 400 some dollars. So it's, it's had its ups and downs. Okay. So first of all, a really basic definition, what is a cryptocurrency? Okay. Uh, and the one I posted up here is literally just copied out of Wikipedia. Um, most of the cryptocurrencies that exist today, and, th and there's at least a thousand of them now, uh, most of them are forks of the Bitcoin code, right? And the Bitcoin uh, code base was released in 2009. The, the main feature that, that makes some cryptocurrencies, that makes some cryptographic, uh, the cryptography is just used to create what's called, uh, called artificial scarcity. All right, because normally when you've got digital technologies, you can copy them at will, right? You've got a, you've got a file, you can create as many copies of it as you want. And obviously in a currency, you need things to be rare or actually unique. You know, if, if I have a $10 coin, I shouldn't be able to make infinite copies of that $10 coin and keep spending them. You know, if, if you did that, you wouldn't have a working currency. So the, the trick with cryptocurrencies is the cryptography is used to ensure scarcity. Every transaction that occurs in one of these cryptocurrencies is recorded on what's called a blockchain. And basically, a blockchain is just a public distributed record, right? a distributed ledger. So blockchains. Um, they're basically a distributed database, okay? It's a distributed database with what we call group commit, which means you batch a whole bunch of transactions into a single group and you commit them into the database all at once, all right? Um, this terminology helps me because I, I come here from a distributed database background. I don't know if it helps you so much, but that's where we are. So transactions are grouped into blocks and they get committed at one time. And typically, there's a very high commit latency, all right? That means blocks don't happen very frequently, okay? Um, for example, in Bitcoin, a block is committed on average about once every 10 minutes, okay? And in normal databases, like SQL, whatever, you would expect commits to happen within a few milliseconds. So this is, this is a really stark, defining difference between blockchain and regular databases, right? Um, in Monero, the block time is two minutes, so it's a little more frequent, but still it's much slower than you're used to in, in the database world. And the other thing about blockchain that makes it a chain is that every block carries a signature of the preceding block, uh, a hash, cryptographic hash. And uh, as each block chains back to with a hash of its previous one, you can start from the tail and work towards the head and know that every block is valid because every block has the correct hash. If you, if you run across a block that doesn't have the correct hash of its preceding one, then you know that something is broken on your blockchain, somebody's been tampering or that sort of thing. Okay. Now, Again, in these cryptocurrencies, the blocks and the transactions are broadcast, basically. They're transmitted across peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, so everybody who wants to use the currency generally has to participate in this network. So every node in the network actually validates every single block. Um, they validate the signatures for, for each one. This kind of processing is extremely redundant. You know, that means You've got a network of a million nodes, and a million of nodes are doing the exact same calculation each time. You know, it's highly redundant, but uh, that's intentional because uh, when everybody is doing the same calculation, they should all get the same answer. If any one of them gets a different answer, you know that something is broken somewhere in your network. So the act of producing these blocks compiling them together, it's called mining. And mining is, uh, again, it's extremely compute intensive based on proof of work. I'm not talking about proof of stake, uh, that's a completely different system. So we're just talking about uh, how Bitcoin, Monero, and, and several other similar coins operate. 
the cost of mining is actually an essential part of the security of the system. Okay, um, because you know it costs significant resources to perform mining. That means it's uh, it's very expensive to attack the network and try to forge data. Uh, again, mining is a bit of a competition, it's a race, so the miner that generates the next block first um, gets a reward for doing so. Now, race conditions do occur frequently where multiple miners could produce different blocks at about the same time. Okay, so uh, in the database world, we call this eventual consistency. The, the chain doesn't always agree with itself all of the time but eventually it'll converge to a single longest chain. Okay. So I reference Bitcoin a lot because you know, it was the first uh, digital currency that's really been successful to any extent. And their aim uh, was to be trustless and permissionless and a decentralized system. Now, you have to understand the context of the world when Bitcoin was created. You know, this was in 2008, 2009, just after the last global recession. And the, the creation of Bitcoin was a direct reaction to the mismanagement of the, of the world's funds by the global banks, central banks. All right. So um, you get people who see, gee, the global banks just screwed us all. How can we create a money system that doesn't have that as a factor, as an element in, in how the system works. And so this, this is what led to the creation of Bitcoin. And they realized that a successful money system needs to have some uh, very essential properties, right? It must be trustless. The system should operate without any trusted third party. You know, the banks were the trusted third parties and they, they broke their trust. You know, they, they screwed a lot of people. They were, uh, there was a lot of corruption going on, a lot of uh, false accounting going on. And so when you place your value in a trusted third party, that third party isn't worthy of your trust, you're totally screwed, right? So you want a system that doesn't require a trusted third party. Um, they wanted the system to be permissionless so that anybody can use it and nobody can deny you use of that, right? Uh, again, if you look at the modern banking system, you know, a, a simple example here in the U.S., um, marijuana is legal in many states in the country now, right? But uh, a lot of businesses can't actually deal in marijuana and have bank accounts because the banking regulations say they're not, not allowed to do this. So again, when you've got this centralized trusted third party that uh, decides who can and can't use the money system, you know, that's, it's, it leads to unfair discrimination and exclusion. And so again, you know, if you're gonna build a new system, you want it to have properties that allow everybody to use it equally and fairly. All right. All right. And, and then, then uh, this uh, leads to the last, last point of decentralization. decentralization. The only the way, way you can guarantee that nobody is going to lock people out is, is if there's, there's no central no point of control. control. If, there's if there's no, no central, central decision maker who can say, oh, oh I, like I like this guy, guy using my coin, but I don't want this guy using the coin. You know, you have to have the power diffused enough that no single entity can make arbitrary decisions like that. Okay. okay, so, so what's that? That's, that's what this slide says right here. <laughs> so, you know, Bitcoin has all these, these great ideals, but in fact it fails um, in multiple ways, all right? It is not actually permissionless, okay? Uh, we already have documented examples of users and accounts being banned or, you know, shut off from access coins being blacklisted based on their usage history, all right? So uh, it is a fact that people can control who gets access to the Bitcoin network, right? It is not decentralized, okay? If you look at um, the distribution of mining power on the Bitcoin network, you know, it's like 80% of that is based in a, a couple small cities in China and 
the rest of the world doesn't even amount to 15%. So there, there is a strong centralization happening here. Um, it also, it doesn't actually behave like cash, all right? It doesn't behave like money. Um, when you spend a coin, uh, when you send a coin to a vendor, you know, you're giving the vendor your complete financial history. And actually, you're seeing the vendor's complete financial history at the same time. You know, you, you see each other's um, wallet address, and you suddenly know everything there is to know about their spending habits. So this, I mean, this, it's insane to even think of it as money, right? If you, if you think, like, okay, I've got a 50-cent coin in my pocket, and I give it to this guy, and he tosses it into a coin jar, all right? Nobody can look at that coin jar and say, oh yeah, Howard put 50 cents in there. There's no way to know that, all right? And um, if you're looking, you know, if the guy with the coin jar is there, he can't tell, oh yeah, Howard still has $2 in his pocket. You know, there's, there's no way to know that in a regular exchange of real money. But in Bitcoin, these things are all revealed. And reve revealing these things is, is detrimental, you know, if you're running a business, if you're, you know, trying to do, if, geez, if you're trying to buy a surprise gift for something, all of these things are totally legitimate use cases for regular money, but they can't be achieved on a public blockchain like Bitcoin. So it fails as a currency. It also fails just as a technology, okay? Um, <laughs> The Bitcoin network today is claimed to support seven transactions per second, okay? Um, if you look at the statistics, it never actually gets faster than three and a half transactions per second, okay? And, you know, put that in perspective, um, a credit card processing network will handle thousands of transactions per second. So you're talking about this global currency and and proclaiming it can be used for everything, but it can't even manage, you know, a, a hundredth of what a, a typical existing currency network already does. The other problems, I mean, technology-wise, you know, the, the code in Bitcoin is loaded with hard-coded constants that uh, constrain how it behaves. And these, <laughs> these constants tend to be a source of great controversy in the Bitcoin developer community. You know, this, this one megabyte block size limit has been there uh, and has been a source of great controversy for at least three years. Uh, the other thing, um, you know, the Bitcoin coin distribution, it's, it's set to have a fixed coin supply. And so eventually, the last coin will be issued in mining, and nobody actually knows if the mining network will continue to operate after that event, right? Because they're trusting that miners will still want to mine based on transaction fees in each block, but there's actually no incentive for them when the, the main block reward goes to zero. All right. So Monero, in, in a lot of ways, you can think of Monero as Bitcoin 2.0, right? It's, it's a system that people designed four years after Bitcoin existed, so they've observed a lot of the problems that, that exist in the Bitcoin technology, and uh, they've come up with solutions to most of these, all right? Maybe not all of them, but all right. It is actually permissionless, all right? Coins are fungible. So they can't be banned, they can't be censored. Coins don't have any history, so you can't choose to ban them. It is actually fairly decentralized. In comparison to Bitcoin, it's, it's much more de decentralized. Uh, and the proof of work algorithm makes centralization more difficult, okay? Now, in the past six months, we've had some uh, examples that would challenge this assertion, but I'll get into that later. Uh, it, actually it actually does, does behave, behave like, like cash, cash, all right? When, when you, you when you spend, spend a, a Monero, Monero 
That doesn't reveal anything about what's left in your wallet, and it doesn't reveal anything to the buyer or the seller about each other's holdings. Right? So it actually does behave like money. The technology is dynamically scalable, right? There aren't really any hard-coded constants in, in the code base that limit its performance. It has a perpetual tail emission. You know, Diego mentioned this earlier this morning. Uh, so at the, at the beginning, all right, you've got a large amount of coins being emitted, and then the number of coins tails off to a small value, but it never drops below uh, 0.3 coins per minute. Right, 0.6 per block. The code base is uh, based on something called CryptoNote, which is a completely separate independent code base from Bitcoin, so it doesn't inherit any of Bitcoin's um, bugs. But it also, I mean, there's a downside, which is we don't inherit any of Bitcoin's uh, adoption either. You know. So just to give you some insight into how the number of coins will progress over time, uh, the blue line here is the Bitcoin coin emission curve, and you can see it, it will max out eventually at 22 million or whatever the value is. Um, and right around the year 2040, the Monero curve will cross the Bitcoin curve, and it will continue, continue growing from that point. Okay, so how does all of this actually work, right? How does Monero ensure that it remains permissionless? And to be permissionless requires you to be uncensorable, and to be uncensorable requires fungibility. Now, Diego talked a little bit about that this morning. This is probably one of the most important characteristics that makes money what it is and makes it usable. Right. So again, you know, one coin equals any other coin. One X mark equals one X mark. Um, every coin is indistinguishable from every other coin. And to get that, you have to have privacy and anonymity for all of your transactions. Right. Once you've established that any coin is completely private, that means it has no individual history that can be traced, right? And once once you have no history, then then there's nothing for you know a controlling entity to try and ban. Right? Um, again, compared to Bitcoin and pretty much every other coin that's based on Bitcoin, you know, the the sender address and the receiver address are both public. They're they're both recorded forever in the blockchain, right? The transaction amount is public, and any particular coin can be traced all the way back to its date of creation. So you can see everybody who's held it from, from any point in time. So you cannot have fungibility without total privacy and anonymity for every transaction. Now, there are some cryptocurrencies out there that provide optional privacy, okay? <clears throat> or uh, they only obscure one or two elements of a transaction. But because the use of privacy is optional, the majority of transactions are still transparent, and the ones that aren't transparent actually stick out, right? They, they become noteworthy. And once they become noteworthy and distinguishable, they're traceable. Uh, the, other the other problem, problem is, is um, in practice, when privacy is optional, the majority of people won't actually use it. Right? They won't even know, they may not even be aware that they need to choose to use it. Okay, so there are, you know, there are a bunch of different elements of a transaction that will show up on a blockchain. You know, how are we protecting each of these elements? First of all, um, your wallet address, you know, the, the long string of digits that identifies your wallet never actually appears in the blockchain. You know, the addresses 
that you, you talk about and, and give to each other when you say, hey, send me money to this address, those never appear in the blockchain. Instead, uh, we use stealth addresses. Right? And the stealth address is randomly generated, and it's a one-time use. Okay, so uh, since it's randomly generated, it can't actually be associated back to any actual wallet address. So everything that's recorded in the blockchain stands on its own. It can't be linked back to any original wallet. So that protects uh, recipients. Now, how do we protect the identity of the sender? Right? We have something called a ring signature. So instead of um, a transaction containing just one coin that a sender is sending out, uh, it actually contoin, uh, contains multiple decoys, right? And currently the Monero ring size is set at seven, which means there's one real coin and six decoys. There's, there's another trick to using ring signatures. Uh, the ones we use are called traceable, which means we can generate a key image that goes with each ring signature, and that key image is unique, that's uh, uniquely associated with the coin that's being spent, so uh, we can identify if a double spend attempt is being made. Right. So if you're familiar with public key cryptography, you know uh, there's always a key pair, right? There's a public key and a private key. If you encrypt a message with the public key, you can only decrypt it with a private key and vice versa. If you encrypt a message with a private key, you can only decrypt it with a public key. Right? So that's, that's a standard uh, single key signature. In a ring signature, uh, you, you actually associate multiple private keys with a message, uh, and anybody can observe this and verify that all of the participants in that ring signature had a valid key, but you cannot identify which one is the original sender. A more recent uh, improvement in Monero, this was de deployed uh, January 2017, it's called Ring Confidential Transactions. Uh, and so prior to this, prior to January 2017, the transaction amounts were published, right? But with confidential transactions, the transaction amounts are also hidden. And the funny thing about CT is uh, this technology was developed by a Bitcoin developer for use in Bitcoin, and they still haven't deployed it. You know, I mean, this was developed three or four years ago, and actually Monero was the first to deploy it. And, and the technology underlying confidential transactions is also based on ring signatures. So there's, there's an ongoing theme there. So I'll give you the basics of how this works. I'm not gonna go into great depth here because that's somebody else's talk. But the idea is uh, you, you store a transaction amount in what's called a Peterson commitment and you are committing to a hash of the actual value, right? So you don't actually show $10 or whatever, you, you, you generate a hash of that actual value. And it's a special kind of a hash. Uh, these hashes can actually be added to each other and the result is still a valid sum. So the sum of two hashes is equal to the hash of the final value. And that, that means you can independently verify that uh, the inputs and the output are exactly what they claim to be, even though you don't know the numbers inside. Oops. Now, the, there's, there's a problem, which is that if you can't see the values inside, um, that's, it's possible for somebody to, to play game, like putting negative numbers in or whatever, right? So, so we also require a range proof that, that asserts that the values are actually within a valid range. In a 
values have to be within you know, 0 to 2 to the 64 minus 1. Um, and so this range proof uh, is basically, it says, uh, in our case, we break a value up into, uh, into binary. We represent it as a string of binary digits. And we just construct a ring signature for each digit. It says, oh yeah, this digit could be 0 or 1. The next digit could be 0 or 2, could be 0 or 4, or 0 or 8. And we or all these together to, to create the final value. And um, as Diego mentioned, uh, a rank quite large. It's uh, something like uh, 1,200 bytes per proof. So this, this has a, a bit of a cost on our network. We're working to uh, reduce that cost when we introduce bulletproofs later this year. Another element of privacy that you know, some people talk about um, is hiding the network address when you actually create a transaction. Right? So we've been working with something called the I2P, Invisible Internet Protocol. It's very similar to Tor, or it's comparable in its purpose. And it'll hide the actual uh, internet addresses of all the participating network nodes. Uh, the, project uh, the project that's working, that's working on, on ITP, ITP is called Cauvery, and they actually had their first alpha release just about a week ago. So that's that's moving right along. And Anonymal is here this weekend, and he'll be talking more about Cauvery as well. Okay. So decentralization. Um, this this has been a pretty hot topic in the past couple of months. The the proof of work algorithm that the miners execute um, is called Kryptonite, and it was designed to be memory hard, which means uh, it uses a lot of RAM and depends on the slowness of RAM to make, make it hard work. Uh, it actually uses multiple crypto algorithms. You know, it uses AES-256, it uses Kesek, Bl uh, Blake, and Gressel, and a bunch of other crypto hash algorithms. Uh, it is, I mean, it was resistant to ASIC implementation, um, primarily due to the cost of putting a lot of RAM on a chip. Okay, that's, that's really the, the main protection it depended on. Uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to implement on GPUs because it uses a, a large number of random accesses into memory. So it, it uses a large amount of memory and it uses it in random order. Okay, and GPUs are optimized to access memory in sequential order. So uh, th there were some considerations to, to how to make this memory hard, but um, I'll get more into that later. In comparison, all right, uh, the Bitcoin mining hash is based on SHA-256, which is a cryptographic hash that's been around for a few years, and it was designed intentionally to be very efficient and very easy to implement. Right, so um, the Bitcoin hash is actually quite trivial to, to put into hardware in silicon, and that's, that's kind of what has led to Bitcoin's problems today. Right? There, there are a couple of chip manufacturers in China that can make super optimized SHA-256 chips, and they keep them all for themselves. So. Now, um, Kryptonite, it was a good idea for 2013 when it was designed. All right, but uh, there are actually Kryptonite ASICs in existence today. Um, I'm wearing some actually. These these are ASICs. I love them. <laughs> but uh, the thing you have to realize is memory hardness is not a good idea because memory is a fast moving target. All right, um, every three years memory tech, memory capacity doubles. All right. Capacity doubles and the speeds increase. Okay, so to base your your entire defense on memory hardness, to me that was stupid. Okay, and now I wasn't around in 2013, so I couldn't tell these guys then. But yes, today I'm going to say that memory hardness is a stupid feature for a proof of work algorithm. Right, it's not adequate. Um, and you know I've proposed a new algorithm. It's called uh, random. Yes. Yes. There, there's, there's actually, actually 
two projects out there now. One of them is called uh, Programmable POW. Uh, I, I helped design that as well. That's, that's aimed more at GPUs, and RandomJS is aimed more at CPUs. But I would say, you know, there's, there's nothing exclusive in those designs. They could, they could work on either. So the main, the main idea here is you want a proof of work algorithm that actually exploits the features of a general purpose CPU, all right? Um, the, like if you look at the SHA-256 algorithm, uh, it was made to be easy to build in hardware. I mean, that, that was its purpose, was to be very fast and very efficient. And if you want proof of work, you want the work to actually be hard. It should actually take some uh, time, it should take energy, and it should take uh, difficult computations. So that's the idea behind uh, the random program proof of work. And these are, uh, I mean, the proof of concept has been out for a couple months, and, it, and, and uh, a more final implementation exists today, and it's just undergoing testing now. Okay. So, uh, as opposed to Bitcoin with its uh, fixed block size and its three and a half transactions per second, uh, in Monero, the block size is dynamic. It's um, based on the median block size of the previous 100 blocks. And the limit, I mean, the only reason to limit the block size is because we're afraid of spam, right? We're afraid of somebody who's going to generate hundreds or thousands of dummy transactions just to clog the network. Right? So um, with a fixed or with a limited block size, uh, the fee goes up as, as you start uh, raising the block size. So somebody who's trying to generate thousands of spam transactions, it gets very expensive for them to keep that up. Also, the transaction fee is calculated based on the transaction size and the block size. So um, all of this feeds together and says, if you're generating a lot of this stuff, you're going to pay more. Now, the fee is also dynamic in that uh, as legitimate usage increases, the fee will decrease. Okay. And again, that's based on a median of the previous 100 blocks. There's another element of scalability, which is simply the size of the blockchain data. All right. and, and this is actually where my involvement in Monero begins. Okay. Um, the original Monero code kept all of its blockchain in, in memory, in RAM. And so uh, if you're working with a PC that's only got a 32-bit processor, you can't use more than two or four gigs of RAM, and then, and then you're done. So the Monero project kind of <laughs> realized they were running into a brick wall. They needed to move the blockchain from RAM into a database. So just some stats. January 2015, you know, the blockchain was five gigabytes in size. Uh, when they put it into the LMDB database, uh, suddenly the RAM usage dropped to only 10 megabytes. Um, and just not only was using LMDB saving memory for them, it actually saved time, right? Uh, even with their memory-only database, which, which you would expect a memory-only data structure should be super fast, right? It should be a zillion times faster than disk. But in reality, maybe because that code just wasn't all that great, um, it was much slower, all right? So even with only 585,000 blocks, it took 4.2 hours to sync that whole chain. Whereas with LMDB, at a million blocks, it took only 10 minutes. Right? So... Um, Using LMDB was a, was a huge step in, in ensuring scalability for this blockchain. Uh, I just measured this a, a couple of weeks ago. I've, I've got a first generation Raspberry Pi. Um, it can sync the whole blockchain. It will take a couple of months, <laughs> but it can be done. <laughs> Okay, okay, so, so um, one of the things, things that, 
that bugs me a lot, all right, because, I mean, I come to software from an efficiency standpoint, okay, primarily. I mean, I've also worked in security, and I understand the trade-offs there, but you have to understand that these, these two needs, these two demands are completely opposed to each other, all right? To get network privacy and anonymity, you have to slow down network performance a whole lot because you're sending traffic through multiple hops instead of just sending it by the most direct path. You know, to get um, on-chain privacy and anonymity, you're sacrificing a lot of performance and efficiency because your transactions are so much larger now to carry this extra data that obscures the original amounts and the original addresses. Right? There's, um, there's a tension here that I, I don't see a quick resolution to. Uh, and, the, and this becomes more important over time Right. If you look at these money supply uh, emission curves, you see that they draw these things out to the year 2050. Okay, they, The Bitcoin guys believed that Bitcoin would be the money of the future and everybody would be using it you know, 30 years later. And I don't think that's really a valid viewpoint. If, uh, if you listen to some people, you know, they're saying, we're going to have colonies on Mars by 2030. Okay. Now, if that's true, it could happen. You know, Elon Musk is going to Mars. Uh, if that happens, that means the currency of the future must work at interplanetary scale. And Bitcoin won't do it. Monero actually won't do it either, right? So what we have today is only the rough beginnings, all right? Nothing of, none of the technology that we use today is still going to be viable 10 or 20 years from now. It's going to be completely different. You know, we may still call it Monero, but it's not going to be based on the same code as we're running today. All right, All right so the final takeaways. Right? Monero is the world's first cryptocurrency that actually behaves like currency. It actually behaves like money. You know, it's fungible, it's private, it's anonymous. When you spend it, you don't give away any extra information about yourself. The design of Monero didn't come out of nowhere, all right? It did benefit from observing Bitcoin, studying Bitcoin and seeing all of its flaws and saying, hey, look, we know how to fix these. Right? And it does work today, but, you know, it's only one step. There's, there's, there's a long evolution ahead of us. Yeah. yeah. Yes. The blacklist exists because of those other funky forks. All right. Basically, um, it, you know, it's not the same as we talk about a Bitcoin blacklist. Basically, uh, we're saying. Here are a couple of outputs that have been used on, um, on, on another chain that forked the Monero chain, and for you to use them could be, uh, or for you to use them as decoys in a valid transaction would be dangerous. Yeah. Bitcoin blockchain is stored in Google Level DB, and that sucks. <laughs> okay, um, as, as an actual answer, all right. Uh, in LMDB, right, uh, the design is it's fully transactional, which means every write is actually atomic. Okay, Level DB is not a transactional database. You know, they, they say that they support atomic writes, but that's not actually true. Okay. Um, so I actually have very little respect for Level DB for a number of reasons, but mostly because they lie, they misrepresent its capabilities. Okay. Um, here's here's the thing. Uh, like LMDB stores all of its data in a single file. Okay. Um, 
within a single file, it is possible for you to do a sequence of operations that shows up in one atomic instant. Level DB stores its data in multiple files. Uh, it is actually impossible for you to update multiple files and have that become visible in one atomic instant. There are always multiple interv intervals of time where you can see intermediate states. Okay, And it's those intermediate states that trip you up. If the machine crashes while it's in the middle of updating a sequence of files, the database gets corrupted because there's no atomic update. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned Bitcoin. Earlier you mentioned. No. There's no speaker. Earlier you mentioned Bitcoin uh, had trouble changing, uh, you know, something as simple as a hard coded value. Um, how do you see Monero? You're talking about even changing proof of work in Monero, which seems like a much grander change. Uh, how do you see governance playing into that? And and do you see an eventual? Bitcoinification of the governance, where you know you kind of move into a comfortable state. It's worth too much money. You can't make these changes without having big, big problems or worrisome problems. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good, a good question, question, and I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I would say eventually it probably will get to that point. Okay, but we're not there yet. You know, right now everybody understands this. This is an experiment. Everybody understands we upgrade every six months. Okay, so that's. That's, That's just, just you, you sign, sign up, up for that, that kind of churn when you participate. You know, every six months this is going to change. Eventually, we may slow that down and say, okay, every one year this is going to change, and then it may slow down even further after that. But we're not there yet. Yeah. Why the Bitcoin transaction? Slow. Why are they so slow? Uh, there's there's a lot of factors that feed into that. Okay, uh, database performance is an element. All right, they're using a slow database. Um, Bitcoin transactions are slow for um, for network propagation reasons. All right, you know they're. <coughs> They're trying to throttle the transaction rate so that a single transaction has time to propagate to the entire network. All right. uh, it's a large network. Um, that's that's going to be slow. You know, there, there's a lot of factors. Uh, okay. Um, would Monero have the same issues with slow transaction speed? Maybe. All right. Uh, you know, my, my personal belief is that we cannot have a single global cryptocurrency. All right. You know, the example with colonies on Mars should prove that to you. We actually need um, some kind of sharding or fractional networks. Right. That's that's really the only way to keep performance up and cover large scale. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we have work going underway to, uh, to support pruning for the blockchain, so that'll, that'll, you know, reduce the size in the future. Does that answer your question, or was it a different question? Network itself is not working on storing arbitrary data. All right, we want to store financial transactions and nothing else. But there, there are other you know side chains that could do that in the future. Yeah. Well. 
Well, okay. Do, does blackballing constitute an attack on fungibility? Uh, but creating the transactions that needed to be blackballed? Yeah, the fork. Forking is certainly a threat. You know, I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have had to go to the step of blackballing. You know, and and we we had to warn people. Look, if you're using you know, XMC or XMO or XMV, whatever the heck they all were. Uh, if you if you are using these things with your existing Monero wallet, with your existing coins, you know, you're going to be putting putting all of the networks at risk. Any other? Yeah. What, what, yeah, what, what can we do to help adoption of Kavri? Um, yeah, start writing code, start integrating it to the apps that you care about. You know, um, all, of, all of this is volunteer work. So whenever somebody says, I want this to happen, they just do it. Or it won't happen. Yeah. Right. Right. Since every ring signature has a key image, uh, you can actually detect that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so at at one point in time, for a glorious eight months, I had a company called Monero Direct that uh, allowed you to purchase Monero using dollars, euros, uh, pounds, whatever. All right. Um, We've, we've shuttered that company for the moment because our payment processor got acquired by another company, and that other company had weird policies towards cryptocurrency, so we couldn't continue with them. Now, in the meantime, you know, I personally still use uh, Kraken.com, right? And may, I mean, I use them because I can buy directly with euros. One more. Wait, wait, one more, one more. What am I working on next? Uh, at the moment, I'm actually trying to get LMDB 1.0 out the door. And one of the interesting features that we've added in 1.0 is uh, database level encryption. And part of the reason that feature exists is so that we can start moving the Monero wallet into LMDB and keep all the data encrypted.